So we are on time, and we've got a lot of things to go through. So I am, I am going to start off. My name is Van Lindberg. Uh, to give you all a little bit of background, I've been, I do essentially computer law. I've been doing it, uh, I've been doing it for I don't know 25 years. I've also been involved essentially with open source for that long, and I've been doing AI since 2008. So all this is sort of, whenever, when the entire world started going crazy about AI, it was, it was great for me. So I want to, this is listed in the AI and data track, but it's also listed as intermediate uh, because it has both legal, we, we go into both legal concepts and AI concepts. And so this is going to be, this is probably sort of a weird audience. How many of you are primarily technologists? Okay, how many of you are primarily lawyers or legally? Okay, well, not quite half and half, but I know that because I'm going to go into both technical details and legal details, I am going to, I am going to disappoint both of you just in different parts of the presentation. For everyone who is, uh, for everyone who has been involved in AI, I'm going to be going through, I'm going to be going through essentially at not a 10,000 foot level, not a one inch level, but like 10 feet to 100 feet low enough that we can talk about some of the details of how things are trained, but high enough that we can get to, uh, but we are going to be abstracting a lot of things. I've done my best to make this both technically accurate, but, uh, and including just enough detail, but also to make it accessible to, to those who, of us who are legally trained. For those of you who are legally trained, uh, I'm probably going to be talking about some cases or things that you're aware of. Um, and if I'm going over stuff that, some stuff that you already know, I'm sorry, but that is also for the other people who are more technologically oriented. But the good news is that this is an unusual enough and, ex and rapidly developing enough area that there is something new in here pretty much for everybody. Another thing that I'd like to, talk, to mention is that when I'm going to be talking about AI, I'm going to be talking essentially only about generative ML. Um, I'm aware of all the other AI. Um, it's been around, of course, forever. Um, but really, generative ML is the thing that has really started to drive this, uh, this AI revolution. And it is the thing that is most interesting from a legal standpoint. Because everything else is just a variety of various algorithms. You know, fuzzy logic back in the 90s. Oh, wow, we get to, uh, we, we, we get to try and figure out percentages of yes or no, and then we, we, we quantize it. Um, or, or A star, you know, it's fine. But none of those things are really as, as interesting or as legally challenging as, uh, as ML. Um, I will also, when I'm talking about ML, I'm really going to be talking about the advances over the past five years and really the past three or four. Um, so moving on. This is also, I've got 40 minutes. This is also the short version of this talk. For anyone who's interested, um, the long version was published in, in the, the law review a little earlier this year. Um, I've also put up the short link. The short link just redirects to the long link. Um, this is essentially a long analysis of, of both how the AI training, how AI training, model training, and inference and generation works, as well as the, the copyright implications from a US copyright perspective. Because we're in Europe, I'm going to be mentioning a few things um, from the European perspective, but uh, this is going to be mostly US law focused, especially because that's where a lot of the current action is. Um, also, but for anyone who is interested in the European stuff, this, uh, uh, Professor Guadamuz has a great article. He touches a little bit on Europe in general. This one's more specific to the UK. I haven't found as good a, uh, a review article on these same topics for, for Europe generally. If I do, I'll, I'll let you all know at some point. Okay, now today we're gonna talk a lot about models. Um, a model is probably the most misunderstood term by, by both a bunch of, uh, by both, uh, by a lot of people. A lot of people say model and they mean the magic black box that does what I want it to do. Um, 
um, but we really need to understand what models are, how they work, how they're trained, in order to apply the correct legal analysis. So before diving into the mechanics of ML training, I'd like to start off with an analogy. And this is an analogy that I've found, found really helps a lot of people understand and get a good mental picture for what's going on uh, in the context of, of model training. Assume that this guy right here uh, is, he's an art inspector, and he's hired to inspect all the paintings in the Louvre. Uh, now, of course, when he's hired, he knows absolutely nothing about art. He doesn't even know what makes art good, what makes art bad, what uh, the different types of art. And so he decides, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to measure everything. So he goes in and he starts measuring uh, the size of each painting, and, and he starts measuring the number of different detectable colors in each painting, and he starts measuring even, even random things like the number of syllables in the artist's name, or which corner they sign in, or, and, and then all the things about it. How about the, the, name of the, the, the name of the artwork, the name of the, uh, of the artist, where they, where they live, what year it was. Um, things that are random, like colors six inches away from each other. Everything possible you can think of that he measures, and he writes it down in his little, no in his little notebook, his, his database. Now, before long, this gets pretty boring, so he decides he's going to start playing a game. He's going to say, every time before he m makes a measurement, he's going to take the things that he knows so far, and he's going to guess. And he likes, oh, what do I know about this? Well, it's, it was done in this year, et cetera. Okay, I'm going to guess that this is, the answer to this question is X. And at first, of course, his, his guesses are terrible. But after looking at thousands or millions of different paintings, his guesses actually get to be pretty good. And so after he's gone through and all these things, he starts to notice all these patterns, and he can effectively guess all sorts of things about a, pa uh, about a painting by having just a little bit of information. So after all this time goes by and he's made all this, the, these inferences, he, he, decide, he becomes actually sort of the world's foremost expert on figuring out, on giving information about these paintings. Because he's been able to, before, he was trying to guess things from what he knew. Now, you give him, you give him a little bit of information and he's able to infer the rest. This is a lot of how, this, this is a lot of how model training works. You really go through these, these five steps. Of course, step five is, is, is repeat. But just like the art inspector here, you go through and you measure things. Uh, a lot of people, when they're thinking about uh, when they're thinking about model training, they talk about, oh, it's reading this thing or it's sucking in all this content. To a certain extent, yes, but to a certain extent, not really. What it's really doing is it is trying to, it's making statistical measurements. It's measuring the statistical probabilities associated with, with various things. It makes a prediction, uh, and then it checks, because as you're going through the training process, there is a known answer, because, for example, in the context of, of something like GPT, the next word is the, is the actual answer, and so it, it guesses. You can do things like, it was a dark and stormy, and many of you will say night. That's, that's a high probability answer. Or you could say something like, the wizard raised, raised his blank and zapped the creature. Well, that blank could be hand, it could be wand, it could be staff. It, it's unlikely to be elephant, but you know these are. But there are all these things. These are probable endings or probable answers to that thing in the middle. It then, once it finds out the once it finds out the an actual answer, it goes back and updates all of its probabilities so that it will be a little bit more likely to give a correct answer, or at least an answer with the correct statistical probabilities the next time. And then it repeats this millions or billions of times. Um, and this is, this is really the AI training procedure for almost any type of ML. This is a little, it, now the things that they are guessing, the things that they're measuring vary from, 
from one application to the next. But this is the same essential procedure. So when you are looking, in order to build a model, you actually create what's called a, an architecture. Now, to be specific, when we're talking about a model, a model really has three separate things. The first is a logical architecture, which is represented like, like here. It's a, it's a logical way of thinking about how we're going to take these inputs, how we're going to take them apart, how we're going to analyze them, um, how we're going to make our predictions, and then how we're going to represent the output. That is actually a logical construct, it is, which is then represented by a particular way, uh, the code that you write to implement this model architecture. That's the thing that you write in PyTorch or, or, uh, or, or whatever. The code in PyTorch is not actually the model architecture, it's the implementation. The model architecture is actually something that's, that's in your head, it's something that, that's mental. Um, the final thing is the, the weights or the data. So what happens is you go through and you have the input layer. This, is, this takes e a separate token. Usually that's a, basically something that's a number. Uh, it, it's a number. It's been changed. Some of the input has been changed into a number. This could represent anything. This could represent a pixel value. It could represent a, uh, a particular word. It could represent... Uh, a value in a log file, it doesn't really matter. But it's been changed into a useful number. Goes through, you have these hidden layers that are in the middle. That's the part that does essentially the guessing. Um, and then it goes through and creates an output. That's the final prediction, uh, the, the final prediction. As you go through, something, you go through and what, you have what's called backpropagation. That's where it updates its, its analysis in order to, to try and try and make its next prediction better. Now, the, um, so when you're going through this set of pre predictions, it's essentially a, a probability for each of those different parts of the hidden layers that a value will be modified or passed on or sent to one place or another. Um, these are called the weights. If you were to open up these, uh, these, these weights are essentially probabilistic. It is not a, unlike a financial model, it's not deterministic. Um, it doesn't have known inputs and outputs. It is essentially, it's a probabilistic mapping from a set of inputs to a set, set of outputs um, based upon these statistical measurements. And if you were to think about it, it really is a lot like, um, for those of you who are aware, aware of Bayes' theorem, um, uh, Bayes' theorem is a way of essentially guessing a particular, the likelihood of an output based upon known, uh, known inputs. What we're looking at when we're looking at these new machine learning architectures is essentially a multi-billion parameter Bayesian calculation. And if you were to open up one of these models on disk, specifically the weights, you would essentially see something that looks like this, just a huge matrix of numbers corresponding to the probabilities associated with passing on value through all those different nodes in the, in the hidden layers. Um, this is actually not, it, it's simply a pile of numbers. It's not creative, it's not expressive, it is really, something that has been developed through essentially this mechanical, ver me mechanical process of refining these probabilities over millions or billions of, of times. Now, why is this important? Um, oh, one other thing, it's hard to say what any, other, what any specific probability uh, actually represents. I mean, they've been able to identify certain neurons or certain things where they think that they can identify some of them. There was an interesting uh, experiment a, a few months ago where people fed a lower level set of weights into a higher level LLM and had to guess essentially what the weights represented. But we really don't know. Um, so 
what does this actually have to do with the law? And the answer is everything. Because if you don't, if you don't apply the proper sort of technical underpinnings, if you don't apply the correct facts, then you're going to start getting all sorts of bad law. And the reason why is because the law is, when you're dealing with the law, it really is a, it's an argument about what is the proper analogy? What are the proper comparisons? And if you, if your, if your model, if your mental model uh, of AI is, it's the black box that does whatever I want, then all of a sudden you get people imputing all sorts of information into it that simply isn't true. That you start imputing log uh, logic and emotion and intent into it when it's not that. It is simply a really complicated statistical equation. That's it. It's not creative. It has some randomness. It has um, it has some randomness that you put into it. It is not expressive. It is just a pile of numbers. But unless you actually see what's inside and you start dealing with the underlying facts, people start to imbu uh, infer all these sorts of things. They anthropomorphize it and says, well, if this was a human, they would be doing this. It would be thinking that. But the problem is it's not a human, so you can't say that. So there's something that we go through in law school called issue spotting. And that is, all right, given a set of facts, what are all the different issues that are going to come up about it. And it is, and it really, when you're looking at these, these AI issues, it really comes down to, oh, I'm missing a bullet here. It comes down to these four, uh, comes down to these four things. And I'm especially going to spend a lot of time on these, uh, these first two, but I'll, I'll touch on data privacy in terms of service as well. So, when we're talking about intellectual property, how do you apply intellectual property to, ma to machine learning? Now, there is, when you're talking about applying IP, and especially IP to machine learning, the first thing you have to say is applying, machine le applying the law to what part of machine learning? Are we applying it to the training process? Are we applying it to the model itself? This this architecture and code and weights? Are we applying it to the outputs? Because you actually have to analyze each one of these things independently because they're not the same thing. They all work together as part of a system to come out with the output. But the inputs are not the outputs and, the, and neither one is actually that model in the middle. So let's, let's start with training. A lot of the questions around intellectual property and AI right now are about how much can I use uh, copyrighted material for training uh, a machine learning model? Now, this is a really interesting question because uh, a, lot of the, a lot of artists especially, but in some cases, coders, um, people here are very concerned about hey, I have this thing that it, it is my work. As you're going through, you're reading my work, you're doing this, you're learning from it. You would have nothing if it wasn't for my work. So you should be paying me for this. But this is where we get back to why we went through that technical explanation in the first place. Copyright, um, and this is, this is true pretty much wherever, both in, both in Europe, um, in Asia, as well as the United States, doesn't protect every use of a particular, uh, of a work. Uh, speaking from the US perspective, there are only a few specific verbs to copy, to create derivative works, uh, and to, to create derivative works, to, to perform. These are the only specific things that are actually protected by copyright. Everything else, it may be a use of the work, but it is either it's a use that is outside of copyright or it is a fair use, which means that it has been judged to be outside of copyright. 
one of those things, um, one of those things that is interesting is that a classic fair use is actually doing analysis of a work. Um, a lot of times this shows up as I'm going to summarize a work. Uh, I, I'm going to, to, to summarize a work and, you know, talk about it. I'm going to provide my, um, I, I'm going to review this, review a book in the New York Review of Books. That review is not, is an acceptable fair use. I can read someone else's book, I can make a review of it, and even though I'm using some of their concepts, I'm using some of their, I'm talking about what they did, I'm allowed to do that because it's a fair use. It is not one of the things that is protected by copyright. Another thing that's been around for a long time is the ability to study a work. For example, it sounds, uh, there has been this idea of, of uh, doing engrams and, and, and textual analysis for a long time, where you were to study and say, how many verbs are there in this work? How many nouns? What, what words are usually together? What collocations? These sorts of statistical analyses are also not part of, um, not something that has been pr protected in the US by copyright. Probably the leading case here for our purposes is the Google Books. Now, how many of you have heard of Google Books? Just about everybody. Google Books was this, the effort by Google and HathiTrust to buy a bunch of books, to scan them, and then use them for, to both improve its search engine and to allow people to search inside these books. Uh, the Authors Guild said, very similarly to what a lot of authors are saying now, you know what, you're using our books, you are copying our stuff, this is not allowed, you need to pay us for this opportunity. It went through all the way up to the, the Second Circuit and then it was appealed to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said no. So this is what, this is what the law is, um, at least in the Second Circuit. Um, that doing, inputting a bunch of work, studying it for the purposes of creating a search engine or a, or a very fancy database is not protected by copyright. It is a fair use. In, in large part because, number one, the thing, this, this search index that, they, that Google created is not a replacement for the book. And they said the only thing that copyright is going to protect is something that is going to compete against the book itself in the marketplace. And they said, you know what? These search, search snippets, they're actually allowing people to do th new things with the book. It creates new works, fair use. Um, this is, a lot of people are looking at that and they're saying, well, is that true even when, even when the result of generative AI is to create new works that in general compete against an author or compete against an artist? Well, here's where you get to that very specific thing. Copyright is about a work, a very specific work that can be infringed this painting, this book, this article. Copyright actually doesn't protect at all your perception in the marketplace, your ability to produce works in the marketplace in general. In fact, copyright is designed to encourage the creation of new works, in part by allowing other people to use parts of your works to, to generate new ones. Um, and so, and, and so this, as a result, the fact that you go through when you're doing this model training and you, what you're doing is you're actually creating a statistical analysis of these works. You're creating measurements of these works. Now, this has not been decided, but this is basically what I argue in that paper in here, is that what you're doing is essentially the same thing that Google was doing when they created the search, the search index. They are making a bunch of measurements and they're creating something that is not a competition for the work. It's com something completely different. And so it is, it, my belief and my argument is that it is going to be found to be fair use. That said, nobody knows. And 
it really comes down to, like I said, this argument of analogies, because that's why I've been trying to get people to focus on the technical, uh, the, the, the technical, uh, the, the, the technical details, the technical facts, is because that unless you get down to that technical level and you see what it's doing, it looks very much like, hey, I'm just copying your stuff, just like a human would do, but it's not. It's just making these measurements. Now there is one tricky thing, and that's, that's at the uh, bottom, that's memorization. This is the thing that is getting everybody up in arms. What happens when you create one of these LLMs or these image generators, and it actually comes out with something that's exactly the same as one of your inputs? The answer is, that's infringing. So don't get me wrong. It is 100% possible to create in copyright infringing outputs from a model. Now remember how I said there's this idea of the inputs, there's the model itself, and then there are the outputs. The model itself, I think, as, I, as I'm saying here, I believe is likely, highly likely to be found to be a fair use. The outputs, maybe, maybe not. It really depends on a specific output. And you can, 100% of the time, if you wanted to create a copyright infringing output out of one of these machine generative machine learning things. Easiest way to do it, if you were to go to the, one of these image generators and type in a copyrighted character like Iron Man. Now, interesting thing in the US um, and a lot of other places, a character that is sufficiently drawn that has specific details can actually be copyrighted, which means that it isn't tied to one specific book or comic book or whatever or picture. It is actually, if you copy those details, even in a different pose, you can create a, a copyright infringing work. So you type in Iron Man, it'll give you back a completely new picture of Iron Man that is absolutely copyright infringing, 100%, um, because it's, co uh, it's infringing on the idea of, of uh, on this copyrighted Iron Man character. In the context of code, because code doesn't have as much many degrees of freedom as English, you're also going to have a lot of times when uh, you're going to have things where, where it's going to drive toward, what happens in memorization is that these probabilities all collapse so it has at least to one particular output. Um, it actually hasn't, it hasn't memorized the, copied the output, it's memorized how to recreate it which is a version of, uh, a version of copying, but it, uh, it's not included in there. But in that case, the result of that is, is the creation of a copyright infringing output. The interesting thing though about uh, machine learning is, uh, is that as you reduce duplication during your training process, and as your model gets bigger, the chances that you will ha encounter memorization go down. In fact, they, there was an interesting study where some people tried to create a copyright, tried to extract copyright infringing outputs from uh, one of these image models. And when they had 90,000 model, 90,000 images, they were able, by spending an immense amount of compute, they were able to find 108 infringing, in, extract 108 of the input images that would have been infringing if they, but when they tried to go through the full sized, uh, Lion 5B and the full stability AI, they were not able to, th maybe they were able to find a few, I forget how many, it kind of ended up being like 0.00013% of the overall, uh, uh, of the inputs that they were able to reproduce. And as they reduce duplication in the inputs and as they get these bottles bigger, that will go down. So. This, however, is going on. We have lots of different lawsuits. You're probably interested in what's going on in each one of these. So these top four have all been filed by the Severi law firm um, in the United States. They are a plaintiff's class action, um, uh, uh, plaintiff's class action firm, as well as Matthew Butterick, who's sort of an independent lawyer. This Getty Images versus Stability AI, there are two cases actually, one in Delaware and one in the UK. They're both asserting the same thing. I'm gonna treat that one differently because it's, it deals with a few different issues. 
the one that probably most of you have heard of, most of you heard of first was actually this Doe's versus GitHub. That was the Copilot case. Now, what's really interesting about this is that they say that this is a copyright case, but unusually, they did not assert copyright infringement. There is no, you copied our stuff in that entire lawsuit. There is, instead, you have removed our copyright information. There is, you have read in our stuff, and therefore, every co all code that you create is necessarily a derivative work. And they are, they play very loose between this legal concept of a derivative work, which means that there is specific expression from one work that has been copied into another. And they use this more broad term of everything is derived from these, in, these inputs, and so therefore everything is derivative work. Um, that one has, that one they, they've filed a motion to dismiss in part because um, they, they've said, look, this is, you're trying to make a copyright infringement lawsuit, but you've not actually argued copyright infringement. You've argued all this other stuff. You argued, oh, you're competing against us in the markets. It's unfair competition. You are using our names, you, using our names. You are removing our copyrighted, our, our copyright license information. But you're not ever, but they're not ever actually saying you infringed our copyright, and you just can't do that. You can't make a fake copyright infringement claim and try and dress it, dress it up without actually accusing copyright. And the problem is, most likely they can't find something that is infringing. They can't make this output, they can't get this particular output for their particular inputs. So that has been filed. There's a motion to dismiss out right now. These. Uh, the next one is uh, Anderson versus Stability AI. This one is about stable diffusion, about the image generator. Here is, again, where you've got poor analogies coming to the fore. They talk about stable diffusion being essentially a 21st century collage tool. What they're doing is they're breaking everything up into pixels, and then they're creating a collage of all those pixels. And therefore, everything is derivative of all this stuff. That one's also had a motion to dismiss, and it sounds like probably almost everything is going to be dis uh, is is going to be dismissed at least preliminarily for a couple of reasons. Number one, two of the three people didn't actually have copyrights <laughs> that they were asserting. They simply said, "Oh, you've infringed my copyright." One of the requirements is that you've registered one. They didn't. Um, the other person, amusingly enough doesn't have her work in the most version, recent version of stability because it didn't pass the, um, the, 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 the filter. The, the, uh, they had a filter of, of whether it was aesthetically pleasing enough, and it didn't pass. Um, so they've been able to show that it's not in there. The other thing is that this broader argument that everything that you do is copyright infringing of every single work, that's a real stretch. These final two are essentially about GPT-4 and Llama, the training of those. There are a number of, of uh, authors that are, have got in those, most notably Sarah Silverman, who is the lead plaintiff on both of these. She is an, she's an author in comic that you may have heard of. The interesting, the way that they're arguing it for, for these three, by the way, they are arguing copyright infringement directly. But the way in which they're doing it is interesting. Instead of saying, look, here's our work. Here's the work that we got it to create. Look, it is, there are there's stuff that's copied. Instead, what they're doing is they're saying, please give me a summary of Sarah Silverman's work. And because it can create a summary, they're saying, look, the work must be in there somewhere. We just don't know how to get it out. But if, of course, it's going to be in there somewhere if it can create a summary. But remember how I talked about the critics in the New York Review of Books? Creating a summary isn't actually one of the things that is going to be protected. So the long and short is all four of these 
they're not good lawyering. They're, in fact, if you are, if you really want to protect the side of artists and authors and you want them to be paid for training, you should hope these guys get off, kicked off the case really fast because they're creating bad law, or they're about to. The interest, most interesting case is actually the Getty Images case. That is also about stability. It's also about copyright infringement. Um, and in that case, again, they have been able to find a specific copied case, or a copied image between the two. They've been able to find images that are very reminiscent. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that the tr model did learn that you should have this little Getty Images watermark on this thing. And so it's creating these terrible looking photos with a bad version of the Getty Images watermark. watermark. And so the strongest argument actually that the Getty Images has is that they're infringing their trademark by creating bad images, sort of like Getty Images, that have their trademark on it. That argument may win, but notice that's not a copyright argument. Another thing about co uh, that's interesting is the um, copyrightability. Currently, the US Copyright Office, the UK is actually saying AI-generated works are copyrightable. Um, it, it, copyrightable, they did that a few years ago. The US is actually saying, um, this was in the Zaria of the Dawn case. Um, this, was, this, this was a case by Chris, Chris Kashtanova. Uh, Chris had created this comic book. Um, comic book. Uh, Chris wrote the, the, the various parts of it and then created all the images with, Mid, with Midjourney, filed for, a, filed for a copyright, received the copyright, and then said, guess what? I created, got a copyright on my book that was partially created with Midjourney. Copyright office said, wait, wait, hold on there, um, and said, you need to explain what you did. So. Uh, my friend Max and I, we helped Chris write a response. And we talked about all the ways in which, in, in which these images were generated. And the office came back and said, do you know what? You don't have enough control over what's coming, of what's coming out. Um, there's, it's too random. You, you don't know it. We're going to actually say that unless you have substantial human stuff after whatever comes out of the AI generator, it's actually not copyrightable. Um, we're actually going through, Chris decided not to appeal that, but we're actually going through in a different case. But right now, the answer is anything that comes out of one of these AI generations is not copyrightable. So if you are using Copilot, by the way, anything that comes out of Copilot, that is not, that is in the public domain, at least right now. Um, I do believe, though, that this is going to be, the, 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 the Copyright Office is essentially speed running through the, uh, through the history of copyright with regard to photography. It used to be that photography was not copyrightable. Then, this, then they said, well, it's copyrightable if you do enough stuff around the pushing the button. Like, you select the lighting and the costumes and the images. If you do enough stuff around it, we'll say that that's copyrightable. And then, about 20 years later, they said, you know what, actually, any time you take an, uh, a picture, it has something of the author, we're going to say that photos are copyrightable. And that's been the law since early 1900s. Right now, they went from not copyrightable to copyrightable if you add enough stuff to it. And I believe uh, that they're going to be arriving at essentially the same place they did with photos, of saying, you know what, by default, it's going to be copyrightable. We're going to say that a human because a human was involved, it's going to be copyrightable, but we're not there yet. However, about two weeks ago, they did ask for comments in the Federal Register. They're collecting them until October 19th, where they asked about this exact issue. Um, one final thing, because I think I've got about two minutes left. Big question, who is responsible? Pointing this specifically to, for, for this group, most of you are probably most interested in who is responsible for, uh, for all the outputs of, of Copilot. In the, um, most, most of these various generators say, you know what, whatever you create, that's your responsibility. 
However, Microsoft has decided to stand behind it with this indemnity clause. The interesting thing about this, that, this clause, though, oh, I, oh. the interesting thing about this clause is that uh, if the code it, it doesn't it doesn't apply if the code is based on code that differs from a suggestion provided for I get how copilot. So unless you plug in exactly what copilot says and you throw down your thing, um, it doesn't apply, which means that this indemnity is unlikely to apply in most realistic circumstances. Um, but you'd have to see whether they do it. All right. Um, don't have a lot of time to talk about this. Interesting, two quick notes on trade secrets. A lot of the public, uh, a lot of the, the primary places that are talking about uh, the primary vendors for AI, particularly open AI, they have a one-way confidentiality clause for their default terms, which means that whatever you do, your, their stuff is confidential, yours is not. Um, the other thing is that it's very hard to keep a trade secret about almost anything in, in AI because it turns out, especially for the weights, almost no IP really applies. Now, that is, that is about all. I think I've got negative one minutes for talk, for questions. So I am going to end, and I will go right outside, and I'm happy to answer to, to talk to anyone. Um, thank you for coming today.